I want to speak to you today about a relationship with God. Several years ago in England, researchers went door to door asking persons about their belief in God. One of their questions was this, do you believe in a God who intervenes in human history who changes the course of affairs, who performs miracles. Do you believe in that kind of God? One man whose reply seemed to be rather typical of the other people's responses said this, I quote, no, I don't believe in that God. I believe in an ordinary God. How many people have fallen into the trap of believing just in an ordinary God. What a tragedy. Colin Smith labels this type of person a passport Christian. Uh, They want to know what they have to do to get a passport to get into heaven when they die. They've been told they must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They've been told that they must believe that he died for their sins on the cross. They've been told that they must believe that he was raised from the dead. They've been told that they must ask Jesus into their heart. And they check all the boxes. They do all of that. They've made their application for a passport to heaven, and they've received it. They've, They've followed the Lord in baptism. And they take their passport to heaven and they file it away in a safe and secure spot. Then they pursue their own agenda and do their own thing throughout their time on earth. At the end of their life, they hope to pull out their passport, present it at the gate of heaven and be received into heaven's glory. Here's the problem with that kind of logic. Jesus did not come to this world to offer us a passport to heaven. He came to invite sinners like you and me into a life transforming relationship with the living creator God. David who wrote this Psalm was the king of Israel And he certainly did not believe in an ordinary God. He did not have a a mechanical connection to God. In fact, the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. He had a spirit-inspired gift to compose poems that were turned into songs that the Jews employed in their worship of the living God. Now the background for this particular Psalm is an interesting one. It's filled with intrigue. David's son, Absalom, was leading a revolt against his father's leadership. For about four years, Absalom had been playing the political game. He had been orchestrating this coup. He had been gaining favor with the people. He wanted to kill his dad and he wanted to be the king of Israel. David got word of this coup and the fact that his life was in danger and his kingdom was threatened by his son. And David and a few of his most trusted men and women had to make a quick exit from Jerusalem. No doubt, David was humiliated as he left behind his palace, his privileges, and his popularity. He and his men were forced to flee to the barren desert environment of the Judean wilderness. He was literally running for his life. How David responded to this crushing series of events gives us great insight 
and into what it really means to have a relationship with God. I, I wonder if we were to pass out paper and do a survey this morning, and I were to give you one question, I wonder how you would respond. What does it mean to have a relationship with God? I, I wonder what you would write down. Let me ask you, do you have a relationship with God? What does a true relationship with God look like? What are the characteristics? Well, in David's psalm here, we see four characteristics of what it really means to have a relationship with God. Number one, there's passion passion. Look in verse one. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You, you see, my friend, for a person who has a, the passport to heaven philosophy in their lives, they don't care if they're close to God or if they're far away from God. All they care about is doing what they want to do in this life and finding all the pleasure they can from this world. But David said, oh God, you are my God. A relationship with God is not something new. It can be traced all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you can take that concept of a relationship with God and fast forward to the last believers who will ever stand on this earth. It is God's will that his people have an authentic, genuine relationship with him, not some kind of superficial attachment whereby we get to do what we want to do and we receive his blessings on top of that. Oh God, you are my God. You see, David sees God for who he really is. Patrick Morley wrote this. He said, the turning point in our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. Boy, what a statement. And David said, I shall seek you earnestly. This speaks of an, an earnest, intense desire to draw near to God, to really grow spiritually. The point is a, a desirability of a, a regular, early, daily longing for God. Do you have that in your life? Do you have this passion for God that was so evident in David's life? Are you willing to start each day by earnestly seeking God's presence through Bible study and prayer? David says, my soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David looked around at the Judean wilderness and it's arid, it's a desert. There's very little water. There's, there's an oasis here and an oasis there. But David is in his tent and a dusty tent and he looks around and he's thirsty. He wants some water. And he compares that to his desire for God. It's an intense longing for God that David had. When C.S. Lewis read this psalm, he wrote this. In his reflections on the Psalms, he, he wrote this, I quote, These poets knew far less than we for, uh, about a loving God. They did not know that he offered them eternal joy, still less that he would die to win it for them. Yet they express a longing for him for his mere presence, which comes only to the best Christians or to Christians in their best moments. They long to live all their days in the temple so that they may see the fair beauty of the Lord. Their longing to go up to Jerusalem and appear before the presence of God is like a physical thirst. Lacking that encounter with him, their souls are parched like a waterless countryside. 
David had a genuine connection to the true God. And that true God had transformed his life dramatically. And he desired above all else to know God and to grow in his relationship with God. Look at verse 2. Thus I've seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory with the same intense desire that David had worshiped God in happier days there in Zion. It would be the same now, desert or no desert. You, you see, when you really have a relationship with God, you don't have to be in a sanctuary to worship God. Now, let me just quickly add, you should be in a sanctuary on the Lord's day to worship God. You say, why do you say that, Pastor? I can worship God just as well on a, a creek bank, on a, a lake, in, in, a, in, in a, a, a field hunting deer. I can worship God wherever I am. That's true, you can. But I'm telling you, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 10 that we as a body of Christ should gather together. Do not forsake the gathering of yourself together as a habit of some is. And we can't use COVID as an excuse anymore. It's time for us to gather in church. It's time for us to worship the living God with the people of God. Do you have a relationship with God? Now, I don't have x-ray vision. I can't see inside you. But I can tell you this. The Lord Jesus knows whether you have an authentic, real relationship with God or not. And he's the one that you will answer to at the end of your life. You don't have to answer to me or to anybody else. But you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do not have a genuine relationship with God, you will not go into heaven. That's very clear. So what are the characteristics of this life tra transforming relationship with God? Well, number one, there's passion. Number two, there is devotion. Look at verses three and four. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. What a statement. David, now you've got to remember the context. He's in the Judean wilderness. He's living in a tent, not a palace. Everything around him is dusty. He has to scrounge around looking for water. He is, he is dependent upon friends to bring he and his people food to eat. And, and he says, oh God, your loving kindness is better to me than life. Wow, what a statement. Now the word David uses here when he refers to loving kindness re refers to the continuance of God's covenant love. His love is steady and unchangeable, which makes it better than the best things this life has to offer. This is how David would go through this ordeal the loving kindness of God. Live or die, the most important thing in his life was his relationship with God. Live or die. The things we value the most, our career, our home, our vehicles, our prestige, our money, our athletic pursuits, our friends, can all be lost in the snap of a finger. Why, do you realize that the Bible says that our lives are like a vapor? Here one moment and gone the next. However, our relationship with God is eternal. And the blessings associated with a genuine relationship with the living God is absolutely phenomenal. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy, the Bible says. In his right hand, there are pleasures forever. Paul wrote 
in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Can you make the same statement that David and Paul made? Are you devoted to God? Can you say, oh God, your loving kindness is more valuable to me, more important to me than anything this life has to offer. And David says, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. David knew that God was his only hope. Only God could deliver him from Absalom and from the army that was coming to take his life. The inwardness of his devotion was expressed by the outwardness of his worship. Whatever time he had left, and by the way, he didn't know how much time he had left. Whatever time he had left, he wanted to spend it in worship of the living and the true God. And then in verse 5, he said, my soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. David is speaking of the great satisfaction that comes when a believer is totally devoted to God and to a passionate pursuit of a deeper relationship with him. You see, marrow and fatness was something that a Jew could understand. That was, that was considered delicacy to them. And he said, my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. And the joy here is enthusiastic. It comes out of David's heart. You, you see, genuine worship does not originate in our head. Genuine worship originates in our heart and it flows out of a heart that is devoted to God, that is passionate for God. So I ask you again, whether you're watching live stream or whether you're in this room, do you have a relationship with God? So what are those characteristics that, that reveal to us a relationship with God. Number one, there's passion. Number two, there's devotion. Number three, there is composure. Composure. Look at verses six through eight. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So David pictures those times, those sleepless moments in his tent. I'm sure it was hot. I'm sure it was dusty. And he's trying to sleep. And his thoughts are intruded by those pictures of Absalom and his army coming to take his father's life and to steal his father's throne. But when David was awakened by those thoughts, you know what he did? He thought about God. He thought about the living God, Jehovah God. Jehovah Jireh, the creator God. And instead of feeling sorry for himself or giving in to his circumstances, he focused on all the times that God had helped him. I wonder, in those sleepless moments, when those anxious thoughts began to penetrate his mind and heart and and cause sleep to fade from his eyes. I, I wonder if he did not think of that time where God intervened for David in the valley of Elah when he faced off against the giant Goliath. 
Goliath was armed to the teeth. Goliath had a sword that was so big. He was a menacing giant. And yet David walked into that valley with a simple slingshot and five smooth stones, four of which he didn't need. And he said to Goliath, I come to you in the name of the living God. And today I will take your head. And he swung that slingshot and that stone hit Goliath right between the eyes. And he fell down like a giant oak tree. And David took Goliath's own sword and whacked his head off. And the Jews had a great victory over the Philistines at that moment. And David remembered that. He said, God, you helped me with Goliath. I wonder if he remembered how God had delivered him from Saul, how God had forgave him and restored him when he committed his horrendous sin with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered. I wonder if he remembered how God had anointed him to be king, how God had promised to be with him. And as he thought about these, the fear and the anxiety evaporated from his heart because he was remembering God for who he really is. And he said, in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. That's a picture of God's presence and power and protection. You see, David respected God's supernatural capacity to do far more abundantly beyond all that he could ask or think. And as a result, he was blessed with a composure that was supernatural and with worship that flowed from his heart. In verse 8, he said, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. That word cling is an interesting word. It's the same word in Hebrew used in Genesis 2, 24, where it says that a husband should cleave to his wife. It's that word cleave. It's the same word used when uh, Ruth uh, said that she wanted to follow Naomi and she wanted to be a part of the blessings of Jehovah God. If you have been satisfied by God, isn't it true that you will want to cling to him too? Darlene, I've been married 47 years and we are closer today than at any point in our, in our marriage. Let me ask you a question. If that's true for, for us on a human level, should we not have that same thing happen to us on a spiritual level in our relationship with God? How many of us can look back in our lives and say, you know, I was saved back here when I was 15 or 14 or 25 or 30. And pastor, I can honestly say that my relationship with God is closer today than it was when I was saved. I hope and pray you can say that. That's what David's saying here. My soul clings to you. I'm super glued to you, Lord. There's no other God for me. I can't make it without you. And then he says, your right hand upholds me. Now, the reference to God's right hand is an important reference. It speaks of God's authority. It speaks of God's power and his ability to deliver us from the severest circumstances we will ever face in our lives. You see, I want you to know that when the bottom drops out in your life and you go through a storm and that storm is vicious and your life is threatened, I want you to know that you can count on God. You can count on God being there. You can count on God helping you just like he helped David. 
Do you have a relationship with God? Is there passion in your life? Is there devotion to God in your life? Is there composure in your life? And number four, faith, faith. I love the way this psalm ends. It, it ends in victory. Now, the victory has not been won yet. But David anticipates that God's going to come through for him and he's going to win the victory. That's what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So he says in verse 9, but those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. Now, these last three verses remind us as believers that we live in a real world. We live in a real world where there are disappointments, where there are frustrations, where there are dangers galore. In other words, it is at the very time when his son had betrayed him and was seeking to kill him that David celebrated his relationship with God and anticipated the victory that God would provide. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. Absalom, Ahithophel, and Amasa were all gunning for David. They would not succeed. They did not succeed. In fact, they would all die, and David would live and regain his throne and his kingdom. Look at verse 10. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. David believed that God's justice would be forthcoming. David was outnumbered for sure. But I'll tell you what, David knew that he was a man of God that he had a relationship with the living God and he could trust God in this severe moment in his life. Look at verse 11. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. Now, isn't this interesting? David comes to a point that literally could have been the end of his life. And yet he's looking forward to what God has for him. One of the most tragic things that can happen to a person, person on this planet is to come to the end of their life and feeling that everything is behind them. Nothing's in front of them. Oh, God forbid that anybody within the sound of my voice would fall into that trap where your whole life is built around the things of this earth. And when you come to the end of your life, when your family is gathered around your bed and you're breathing your last breaths and you look at them and all you can think about is what's behind you and you can't think about what's ahead of you. I'll tell you, if you operate on the passport to heaven philosophy, you will come to the end of your life and all you can focus on is what's behind you because you have nothing in front of you. David knew the best was yet to come. So let me ask you, are you counting on a passport to heaven Will you please, and I beg you, please listen to the words of Jesus. Here's what Jesus said. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not, now, now listen to the, to the, a passport to heaven crowd. Here's what they say. Did we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
depart from me, all you who practice lawlessness. What is Jesus saying here? Here's what he's saying. Passport denied. I remind you, Jesus did not leave heaven, clothe himself in human flesh, come to this earth, live a perfect and pristine life, go to the cross of Calvary, die for our sins, and be raised from the dead, ascend back, ascend back to God's throne. He did not do all of that so that you could have a passport to heaven. He did that. So you could have a relationship with God. Do you have a relationship with God? I've given you four characteristics. These are not all of them, but these are right here in the text. Four characteristics of somebody who has a legitimate relationship with God. Number one, passion. Number two, devotion. Number three, composure. Number four, faith. So on behalf of the Lord Jesus, I'm inviting many of you to turn from your sins and to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm not inviting you to fill out some kind of passport application today. I'm inviting you to turn from your sins. Believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And trust him as your Lord and Savior and commit your life to him. I'm going to ask our our worship team and our staff to come forward. And in just a moment, we're going to worship. We're going to do what David did. David just absolutely had a, a heart of worship. And we're going to worship the living God today. And I'm going to invite you to leave your seat And to come to one of our staff members, here's all I want you to say to them. I want to have a relationship with God. And we'll help you with that decision. There are families here and you need a church home. And if you want a church home, you come to one of our staff members. But I want to say a word to believers. You've not bought into the passport to heaven philosophy. You've not. You know it's bogus. You know it's not going to get you into heaven. You know that if you follow that line of logic, you're going to hear Jesus say one day at the great judgment, passport denied. I don't know when it was. Maybe it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and you entered into a relationship with the living and true God. And there was a time when your heart just burned with a fire to know Him, to serve Him, to love Him, to glorify Him, to please Him. But here recently, that fire has been reduced to a flicker. And whereas once you had that passion and that devotion, that composure, that faith, they're still there, but they're at a much smaller level than they were before. Do you know that that God wants you to be revived today? He wants to take that flicker and he wants to turn it into a raging flame and he'll do it if you're willing to say to him today Lord I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit anymore I want to give you all that I am Lord renew my passion renew my devotion renew my composure renew my faith just come to the altar Bow your knee before the King of glory and ask him to do a special new work in your heart. Father, 
You're a good God. Oh, you're so good. Father, it blows my mind that you would want to have a relationship with sinners like us, but you do. And Father, I thank you that you've made that a possibility through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for those today who do not have a relationship with you and I pray today they'd be saved. I pray for those who are saved but their relationship with you has become not as fervent as it once was. And I pray you'd renew them, restore them, revive them, Lord, in their soul. Lord, have your way in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.